Today, we look at the Go error system from an architectural perspective. Rather than looking specifically at the code and how it works, we'll focus on how well the system fits into software architecture concepts. You'll also notice a lot of similarities in the Rust programming language. Note that this is entirely an opinion-based video coming from someone who hasn't coded much in Go. Feel free to discuss this topic further in the comments. We'll split this video into two sections, Go as it is now and Go in the future. Go has two distinct methods for dealing with errors. The first option is to explicitly return an error object in your function. The possibility of an error becomes part of the interface of your function and the error does not automatically propagate. The second option is to cause a panic. This is closer to the throw keyword in other languages where the error is automatically propagated and must be caught otherwise the entire program terminates. This is often referred to as stack unwinding. This distinction is the foundation of an error system that I've started to develop and use which to me has great architectural benefits. This error system consists of two types of errors, API errors and implementation errors and you could use different names for those, but those are just what I've decided to use. API errors are a custom set of predefined errors provided by an API or package. These errors are directly associated with the functions you are invoking. For example, if you are performing a HTTP request, you would expect to receive a HTTP status code. If you are reading a file, you would expect an error to be related to file management, such as a file not found error. And if you are allocating memory, you would only expect an out of memory error. API errors are strongly connected to the API, hence the name I've given them. This is conventionally achieved in Go by explicitly returning an error object or some other values such as a status code or an OK Boolean. Because your API will have its own set of errors, it's typically necessary to map between errors you encounter and corresponding errors that you've defined for your API. Let's look at an example where you have a function that queries for an object in a database. If you decide to create a local database implementation using a map, when you encounter a key error you should more appropriately return a resource not found error. If you are instead communicating with a real database, you should map a no rows found error to the same resource not found error. This might be obvious, but I thought it's worth mentioning. Implementation errors, on the other hand, are not directly associated with the function you are invoking. They are caused by errors coming from implementation details, hence the name I've given them, that do not suitably map to custom API errors. These are unrelated errors that prevent the function from completing. A simple example is an out of memory error or an internal permission error. There are two methods of producing these errors as a type of API error or as a flow breaking error. The first option is to define a type of API error called an implementation error. This error should wrap the underlying error for debugging purposes, but the API users shouldn't attempt to check the type of the underlying error, as this is heavily implementation specific. Go has a built in way of wrapping errors to accomplish this, although I haven't looked at that very much. This method of handling implementation errors is applicable to functions that perform external communication and already return errors related to impurity. At this stage, all the API users should know is that something went wrong internally and the function had no option but to bail out. If the API user feels that execution should not continue, they may propagate that error as their own implementation error. The other option is to cause a panic, which breaks the regular flow of the program. This should be typically used in pure or deterministic functions, where we always expect the same output for a given input as part of the contract. Errors that are consistent for the same input, such as input validation errors, should still be manually returned along with the function output, assuming this isn't in a separate validation function. Uh, but errors coming from impurity that have no connection with the input must break the flow of the program. Otherwise, the API contract would be violated by not being able to return the correct value. 
Under the hood, if we break through layers of abstraction, everything is impure and we have to embrace this fundamental fact. The other use for panic is of course in extreme cases where the entire program is on the verge of crashing. The documentation for the Rust language, which has a similar error system to Go, explains this nicely. Quote, it's advisable to have your code panic when it's possible that your code could end up in a bad state. In this context, a bad state is when some assumption, guarantee, contract or invariant has been broken, such as one or more of the following. The bad state is not something that's expected to happen occasionally. Your code after this point needs to rely on not being in this bad state. There is not a good way to encode this information in the types you use. End quote. Implementation errors will often propagate to the outer layers of your application where the decision to use a specific implementation is made. This is often a nice appropriate spot to deal with the error. Across languages, an implementation decision is made using dependency injection, higher order functions, static compile time linkage, etc. We must embrace the fact that implementation details cannot always be encapsulated and we must only depend on those details in the part of our code where we are responsible for constructing that concrete implementation. So let's recap the architectural benefits. With API errors, we know precisely what errors a function can produce and can write appropriate code to compensate for them. If you don't know how something can go wrong, how can you write resilient code? You also must be explicit in ignoring an error, resulting in safer code. Implementation specific errors are mapped appropriately or otherwise panicked to be handled in an appropriate spot where that implementation is constructed and where which we depend on the implementation details. Panicking allows us to abstract away impurity in deterministic functions. This error system can be reasonably achieved in the Go programming language. We'll now discuss some problems we face with the Go error system as it is now. The first is the error interface. This makes it very easy to return an error that is not one of the concrete API errors that you've predefined. Because of the lack of union types, it's almost impossible to entirely enforce error restrictions. I am curious if there is a way to solve this problem in Go, and if you know any, please leave a comment below, uh, but I'll definitely have to take a look at this again. You can see throughout many Go code bases that people just check for errors, and if there's an error, they just return that same error, and this is almost equivalent to the problems we see in other languages with implementation specific errors being automatically propagated. In the case of Go, it's just manually being propagated. Secondly, functions such as fumpt.errorf work only with this generic error interface and shouldn't be used because otherwise you are clearly not using any predefined error types. We'll now move on to Go in the future. The main thing I'd like to cover is the upcoming try function, which is currently being proposed. This function consumes the error object returned by another function and may break the function level flow of the enclosing function by causing it to automatically return the error object if it isn't nil. Wow, that was a mouthful. So basically, if there is an error, it will automatically return that for you. This idea sounds nice on the surface and definitely enhances code readability, although some argue the lack of clarity and the requirement of understanding this magic function. I partially stand against this proposal from an architectural point of view, which I just summarised a moment ago. This proposal only covers a single use case, making it convenient to directly return an error coming from another function, and this incites bad architecture in many cases. This completely breaks the concept of mapping or wrapping errors as described earlier. Following my previous issue where generic error interfaces are used as return types, it is too easy to return an error type that the function user isn't expecting, often coming from an implementation detail. In the rare cases that you do need to propagate an error, such as in recursive functions, I think we can stick with the verbose method for the time being. Although there is an option to use the fur for mapping errors, much of the critical information is lost at this point and I would say it's much more suitable to do this where you initially come across the errors. Also, the try function would then create a dependency on something that is no longer conceptually free but tied to a primitive language implementation, the error interface.
If you wanted to implement your own error type or use an OK Boolean for example, this solution would not help. I've mentioned that the only acceptable and convenient use of the try function that I've seen is in recursive code. For example, a recursive function that traverses a tree and processes individual node types differently. Before Go jumps the gun and implements this proposal, they must look at the possibility of a statement that's more general purpose than try, for conditionally returning objects other than errors. It is quite common to have a conditional return statement, for example to propagate a value in a tree based recursive function from the leaf to the root. This would give equal value to any necessary convenience for conditionally returning error values and conditionally returning other values. Also, this would solve the issue about the tie-in to the primitive error type. If no feasible solution exists for this, then the try function should be abolished altogether. So that sums up my opinions on the Go error system and how it works quite well with how I like to handle errors in my code bases. Thank you to my top Patreon supporter, Helgsfer Hesevik Lizette. If you enjoy this type of content, please hit the like button and also consider supporting me via Patreon. I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions in the comment section below. So thanks for watching and I'll catch you again in the next video.